This episode is brought to you by Sterling Soap Company. How often do you think about your soap? Well, if you answered, not much, maybe you should. You see, a lot of what passes for soap in stores is technically not soap, according to the FDA's definition. It's full of lab-created chemicals and detergents because, well, it's cheaper to make. Now, what if you could buy natural soap made from natural ingredients like tallow, palm oil, coconut oil, and scented with essential oils, and for just a little more than you'd pay for grocery store soap? Sterling soap is 100% natural, and with a wide variety of bath soaps, shave soaps, beard balm, lotions, and cologne, there's a product and a scent for just about everybody. Check them out for yourself at sterlingsoap.com. That's S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G soap.com. Are you a hockey fan? Then you'll love Eric Zweig's new book, Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2. It's a treasure trove of untold tales, bizarre incidents, and captivating trivia that will leave even the most devoted puckhead astounded. The intense rivalries, epic showdowns, and historic clashes that shaped the NHL's early years, it's all in there. Zweig uncovers the true stories that helped shape the sport, ensuring that you will never look at hockey the same way again. Check out Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Welcome back to This Day in Sports History, a member of the Sports History Network. Head on over to sportshistorynetwork.com for more info and more podcasts. One of the podcasts you'll find there is Sports Forgotten Heroes, hosted by Warren Rogan. You can find Sports Forgotten Heroes there or wherever you listen to podcasts. And this is your host for This Day in Sports History, Steve White. It is August 11th, and on this day in 1991, it was the most unlikely person to win a golf major. John Daly was hanging out at his house in Germantown, Tennessee on Wednesday afternoon, August 7th, when the phone rang. Daly picked it up, and on the other end of the line was PGA Tournament Director Kenny Anderson. Daly was the ninth alternate to play in that week's PGA Championship. Anderson told him that they'd lost four golfers already from the field, and there was a possibility for him to play. Now, normally in a major, one or two may drop out. Injuries like Paul Azinger's lingering pain from recent shoulder surgery, or in Lee Trevino's case, the course just didn't fit his game. It was too long. When Nick Price let Anderson know that his wife was about to give birth and he was withdrawing from the PGA Championship, that was the fifth golfer to withdraw. Now, this was Wednesday evening before the tournament teed off. Anderson got on the phone to the next alternate on the list. Bill Sanders was that guy, and he said, eh, no thanks. Mark Lai was the next man up, and he also declined. Brad Bryant was alternate number eight, who was home on his couch in Orlando when his phone rang. He also said no. It was too far, and he wouldn't be able to get a practice round in, and he just figured he didn't want to go that far and just not play the weekend. Daly was the next name on the list, and he was already in round. That's how close this Cinderella story of epic proportions nearly did not happen. Daly was the next name on the list, and since Anderson had already called him, He was already on his way. Daly made the eight-hour, 500-mile journey to Carmel, Indiana for a chance to tee it up in the PGA Championships. He didn't actually get the confirmation that he was in the tournament until he got to his hotel room in Carmel after midnight. Now, Price knew Daly from years before when John played the South African golf tour, and so he offered up his caddy, Jeff Squeaky Medlin, to use for the tournament. After a few minutes on the range, it was time to grip it and rip it. So put this in perspective for a few seconds. Here's Daly, a 25-year-old PGA Tour rookie who had a top 10 at the Chattanooga Classic, but had only managed to make the cut in 13 of his 24 events that year. He'd been a professional golfer for three years. He'd played on the Hogan Tour and on other tours in different parts of the world, But this was a golf major. Where this tournament was held was Crooked Stick, and he had never played that golf course before, so he had no familiarity with it. No chance for a practice round like everybody else had gotten. And this was 
Not some short muni, this was a 7,300-yard par 72 beast. It was the second longest course in a PGA Championship at that point. Of course, a layout of that length played right into John's game. So, there was nothing to do but to do it, and he went out and he fired a 3-under par 69 to finish the first round two shots off the lead. By comparison, two-time U.S. Open champ Curtis Strange shot 81 that day, and he withdrew. Now, with a little familiarity of the course, Daly carded a 5-under 67 in round two. Now, he didn't just make the cut. His name was on top of the leaderboard at this point at 8-under, and his fans grew by legions. The gallery gawked at his big take back with the driver going way past parallel, the ball rocketing off his club face, soaring 300 plus yards down the fairway, punching holes in the ozone layer, as CBS broadcaster Gary McCord commented. Nobody really took note of his feather touch around the greens, though, but he was truly driving for show and putting for dough. He was on fire. But sitting atop the leaderboard brings pressure. Many crumble under that pressure of sleeping on a lead, and it would have been understandable if Daly had slipped. Everybody sort of expected him to do it anyway, but he didn't. A third round 69 put him three shots clear of the field. So did Big John head on back to his hotel room after his third round and chill the night before the biggest round of golf that he would ever play in his life? Nope. Instead, Daly, who had been a pretty good place kicker back in high school, made the trip to the Hoosier Dome, where the Indianapolis Colts were playing a preseason game against the Seattle Seahawks. He was brought down to the field between quarters, and he actually kicked a field goal in his street clothes. He was more Mark Mosley than Garo Yapremian in his run-up, but CBS broadcaster Jim Nance said he witnessed it, along with the 48,000 at the Hoosier Dome that night. The next day, this day in 1991, Daly was as loose as he was the night before. Even an opening hole bogey didn't shake him. He came back with a birdie at the second, another at the fifth. He had a five-shot lead after the eighth hole. He broke his string of seven straight pars with a birdie at 13, added another at 15 to push his lead to five shots, which gave him enough of a cushion to absorb a double bogey at 17. A par at the last, and the blonde-haired, mulleted John Daly had done the improbable, if not the impossible. He finished three shots clear of the field, going from ninth alternate to PGA champion. He cashed a $230,000 winner's check, changing his life in a span of four days, and the world had been introduced to a true one of a kind. Daly was the first PGA Tour rookie to win a major in 15 years. On this day in 1950, Legendary New York Yankee Joe DiMaggio was benched for the first time in his career. Manager Casey Stengel was looking to change things up as his team faced off with the Philadelphia Athletics. The Yankees had lost the day before and slipped five games out of the American League lead. DiMaggio, the man who held the record for hitting safely in 56 consecutive games, was mired in a slump. He was hitting 279 and had only picked up four hits in his previous 38 at-bats. So instead on this day, Stengel penciled in Cliff Mapes to play center field and hit seventh. Mapes only picked up one hit in his four plate appearances that day, but it was a big one. In the seventh inning, Mapes had a two-run shot with two outs to give the Yankees the 7-5 lead, and they went on to beat the A's 7-6. DiMaggio would not make it back on the field until the 17th, but he was a late-inning defensive replacement in that game, and he didn't get a plate appearance. He would not make it back into the starting lineup until the 18th, when DiMaggio went 1-for-4 with an RBI against the same Athletics, this time in Philly. Stingle had a bit of a tense relationship with DiMaggio, and one of the most embarrassing moments of Joe D's career in a game the following year in July of 1951 Stengel removed DiMaggio in the second inning of that game in which DiMaggio was already standing in center field. In that instance, he had a gloveless teammate trot out to the center to deliver the bad news to Joe, and he was replaced by a rookie. He retired after that 51 season. How about this classy move by the Atlanta Braves on this day in 1968? Satchel Paige was looking for a team, any major league team, to sign him. 
Page, a veteran of the Negro Leagues and a pitcher who made his debut in the Major Leagues with the Cleveland Indians in 1948 at the age of 42, was 158 days shy of the five-year minimum to qualify for a pension. Page had talked with 19 of the Major League teams up to this point, and all had said no. Page was 62 years old, and not many figured he had much to offer. But Braves president, William Bartholomew, decided to do the right thing, and so he said yes when Page reached out to him on this day. He signed him as a part-time pitcher and as an advisor. At the press conference announcing the signing the following day, Bartholomew said, Satchel Page is one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Baseball would be guilty of negligence should it not assure this legendary figure a place in the pension plan. Page was added to the active roster, but he never made an appearance. He did lend his expertise to the Braves staff, though, instructing on technique and conditioning. But the biggest thing was the fact that Satchel Page was able to spend the time needed to secure his much-deserved pension from Major League Baseball. And the state was also a big one for home run milestones. On this day in 1929, Babe Ruth became the first to hit 500 career home runs. Of course, he was also the first to hit 200, 300, and 400 career home runs. Ruth was alone for 11 years as a member of the 500 Homer Club. It would not be until Jimmy Fox hit his 500th in 1940 that Ruth would have a companion on that list. On this day in 1971, Harmon Killebrew hit career homers number 499 and 500 to join the club as well. And in 1980, Reggie Jackson hit career home run number 400. It would be another four years for Mr. October to become the 13th major leaguer to get to 500. And on this day in 2020, the Columbus Blue Jackets and Tampa Bay Lightning set an NHL record combining for 151 shots on goal. This is obviously not a typical time of year when we're talking about hockey. Of course, 2020, COVID, the NHL season was shut down in March, and the playoff ponds were started back on August 1st. This was game one of the playoff series between the Blue Jackets and the Lightning. The game went to five OTs, and when Tampa's Braden Point took shot number 151, he scored the game winner. This was also the fourth longest game in NHL history. The 151 combined shots was equaled in May of 2022, when the Pittsburgh Penguins and New York Rangers played a 4-3 game in three OTs. Time now for today's non-sports did you know. Be careful if you happen to be wandering around the Peruvian Amazon. There's a boiling river hidden deep in that part of the world. Well, not quite boiling, but it's pretty close. For the occasional clumsy animal that wanders by and falls in, it is hot enough to cook them alive. That's all for today. Check back in at the same time tomorrow for another edition of This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sports. HistoryNetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me. 
and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I am through. If you're through.